Hi, good afternoon, home language. That's week 12. Today is the 25th of October. It's just before five o'clock, or it's just after five o'clock. And this is our finale. I feel we need to have some kind of party, balloons popping. Um, I'm sure you're going to be very relieved that this is all coming to an end. Um, but the journey's just about there. For this, for tonight, I'm just going to quickly look at assignment four. It's only work, only counts 10%, so don't have to worry about that. And just pick up on some best language teaching practices, just reminders of that. I think I covered this in semester one as well, but just a reminder, we always need to be reminded of these things. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. Last time, isn't that wonderful? So, best language teaching practices. And here we are, week 12, um, end of the year is in sight, assignment um. Assignment three comes in tomorrow night, and then on the 6th of November, we've got assignment four, and then we're done. Um, so I just say we love teachers, especially language teachers, English language teachers. They are all amazing, um, and that just makes us all special and you special. So we can look at best teaching, language teaching practices tonight. But before we do that, just quickly look at the, the spreadsheet. Um, we just had a meeting about not having... Um, event uh these all these trackers so what i must just ask you maybe in my mentee again is what you think about these online trackers okay um if you have a look there is we've got this one coming up to you now week 11 uh at the end of the day week 10 we had 48 sp and 63 sps completing it's about 30 down um, i suppose because it's a bit tedious and it's hard to do but i think you've got until the end of next week for that um, yes, and we've got, oops, we don't have the sad face, and as you can all see, we've got the 26, it's your assignment, three coming in, I've had lots of emails, lots of queries, I thought it would be a breeze to do this assignment, but it seems like there's so many issues, uh, similarities, I just want to say that if your assignment has got an article with a full reference, full reference, in-text in citation, full reference, or is is FETs, you've got your cartoon and your um, advertisement with in-text citations and full um, references at the end. The, the instructions and um, headings are okay. Don't worry too much about that, as long as your questions are original. If you've got line references from the text, please indicate quotation marks and put the line num the reference, the line references or the paragraph references in that. And then we've got the 6th of November is when your assignment all becomes due. Yes, it's all coming to an end now. So the mentee has continued. Um, we did the feedback one. Um, the first one, how often do you read your feedback? And it seemed like most of you didn't do it. And then I looked again yesterday, and it seems like always is now winning. So it's a good thing that um, just more than never, <laughs> always people are checking their feedback. Please go and look at the feedback um, because that really does give you a good idea of why you got your mark. And I think it's a good idea to interact with your feedback as well. Um, here's the new one um, that is on um, week 12. I have stuck it there. How often do you watch Zoom or can recordings, your lecture recordings? I'd like to know how often you do that. Um, please be honest. Um, it's good to get this, these, this information um, because let me know what students are really doing. Okay, just a quick roundup of tasks, activities, and assignments. Um, what have we still got to do? Assignment three comes in tomorrow night. Assignment four comes in on the 6th of November. How often do you, the two mentees now that you can go and look at, how often do you read your feedback? How often do you watch the canned and Zoom recordings? Um, next week from the 31st of, of October, I will open up weeks one to four trackers for those of you that never got to do them. You can do them then. The R course surveys now coming from Stadio um, one, two, and three. They have been put on Canvas and activated. They look like this. I think they're under assignments. I'm going to go and stick them the links in also for week 12. So you can see them there. You've got until the end of the month um, to finish them. Um, I've got you the 28th of November for assignment for student evaluation three. Um, I might just have to change that. But they're the questions. They're quick and easy. Please just go and do them as well. That's when you can have your say. So that's it. That's all for the activities. And we finished. And it's what I feel like I have a bit of a firework display. Um, 
just as a celebration that we have actually reached this far and we've actually survived. Okay, not quite there, but we're getting there and that's a good feeling. So let's just look for, at some tips for writing your course reflection essay. Um, I'm asking you to include headings as indicated in the marking guide. I'm going to look at that now. Headings helps you to structure the different sections. And why I want you to put headings is in is because when the markers mark, the heading sections have different mark allocations. So just remember that. Um, so consider the mark allocations. If it's for 25 marks, you have to put more in. If it's only for 10 marks, you won't have to put that much in. Um, focus on what you've been asked. Um, do not just write down everything you know. So if you've been asked about TP, answer about TP. If you've been asked about writing, us answer about writing. Provide clear and specific examples. If it's something about TP, TP, give an answer on what happened in TP. And this is a, a way you can look at this. is It's called the Peel method. It's when you respond to something, you you make the point, then you explain it. Um, TP was a very good experience. And explain why he said that. Evaluate it because my teacher, my teacher gave me so much help and assistance. And this is why I want to say in this part of the area, in PGCE, it's essential to go on teaching practice or something to that extent. Structure your paragraphs cohesively. That means you've got a topic sentence for each of your paragraphs, then supporting sentences. And when you start your next topic, you go to your next paragraph. Yes, you are English teachers. So please type professionally. That means you've got to edit. If you're like me, sometimes your fingers get a bit messy then correct your grammar and spelling and punctuation. Don't have any blue lines or red lines. Um, markers are looking for ability to analyze and engage with the essay um, requirements. So please make sure they can easily see that. This is just an example of what the introduction looks like. Um, I'm going to look at that in the next slide now. This is from someone's past paper. An introduction starts with giving an overview of what the essay is about. Um, then there's going to be what a reflection is. Um, you can use a quotation for that and put an in-text reference. And then how are you going to structure your essay? That's important. Whereas the conclusion is an overview of the whole essay. You're going to give a summary. You're going to make a main conclusion. But you're also going to include a recommendation for future PGCE students. So this one says, my recommendation is, I'm just going to go back there. My recommendation is, uh, for students should stay on top of the workload. I think you can all agree with that. I would encourage them to work on their PGC at least every second night and to attend as many online lectures as possible. This course is so beneficial. If you could give the focus and time that it needs, I would really, really recommend you to do that. So this is wonderful advice. Um, so what you reap, you will sow. So this is what someone wrote about their recommendations for future PGCE students. So just want to clear writing is that when a person looks at what you've written, it doesn't look like this one big long paragraph, which is quite scary when you see that. In the second image, you can see she says, oh, because you can see there's bullets, there's scripts, there's pictures, and it's so much easier to read something that is coherent and cohesive and doesn't hit you with one massive paragraph with no headings and no paragraphs either. So clear writing includes introductions and conclusions. You must include that. It contributes to clarity of your answers if you are having got clear writing. It prevents a marker from having to guess what you mean. Sometimes you can't understand what you're saying. And remember, this is an English essay and marks are also allocated for use of language. And you are English teachers as well. And then please keep to the 2,000 word count. No, nothing more than that. Less, yes, but nothing more. Good writing is clear thinking made visible. Remember that. Okay, if you've got good writing, you've got clear thinking. So assignment four overview quickly. Um, it's a course and language teaching reflection for the semester. Um, this is the structure for TFS. I did one um screenshot so please don't worry about that um it's basically the same for all the assignments first of all you've got to have an introduction um a topic overview rationale and essay structure then you've got the body and you see there's three sections of the body um i'll look at that in the next slide now then you've got the conclusion at the end which is the content summary the conclusion and the final recommendation for future pgce students okay 
So this is at the end of your assignment four, you'll see something like this. So the introduction, what you must have in your introduction for 10 marks, there are those three things. The body, you've got for 25 marks, dis discussing the course, whatever it might be, the CAPS document, what you think about it, evaluation, example, your TP, and any recommendations you can make for the course. Then you've got language teaching principles for teaching grammar and writing in the South African context. So because you come from a multilingual and multidiverse classroom, how will you teach grammar and how will you teach writing? Then your achievements, all the things you did well with, your challenges, I'm sure there were some, hey? Then your language teaching recommendations that you can make as well. That's out of 20. Then you come to your conclusion. The structure is exactly as it is there. Your final recommendation. We're looking for that 10 marks. Language use 5, referencing 5. And this gives you a mark out of 100. Counts 10% of your final mark. Okay, go ahead and enjoy it. So we into unit 3. We're finishing off tonight. I've done the CLA, looking at what it is and looking at um, different kinds of activities. There's your reference on Ferreira. We're getting on to examination writing now um, with the submission of assignment three. So all thing about testing and assessments and rubrics and theories have all come about with assignment three. So hopefully just by doing the FP or both SP and FET exam for paper one and paper two or paper three, you've got some understanding of what is required to set an exam. Okay. Hopefully. So remember, we're all global students. I've got students from South America, Namibia, Singapore, Greece, I think, as well. Um, and there I am in 2020 when the whole program started. I'm sure you can see some of your lecturers that you know so well. Um, there's um, Dr. Browning, who's now our head of academics, there's our dean, all part of the study of uh, material. Okay. I've taught in the UAE, as you know, there's my students at an uh, international um, college, private college, where they are then. And I was just observing that class. There's some of the lovely girls doing tests for me. This is in another um, university where I taught. Um, there's all my students. And it was an Emirati government um, university. There they were collecting um, garbage and cleaning up outside the university where we were. Um, this is in South Africa, visiting and helping teachers, teaching grade eights and nines. I loved going into those classrooms. Um, there you can see in another school that I was, there's the fabulous teachers and the happy students. Um, and it's always good to be a teacher and be involved with the wonderful students and pupils and learners that we have as well. So there's about five things I'm going to quickly chat to you about tonight. It's not lots. And we're going to look at literacy acquisition models. We're going to look at the importance of copying and modeling practices for, for proficiency. Guided practice model, which is also about modeling. Then some imaginative teaching practices and then a conclusion. Okay. So this is the second language acquisition model. And this is from Cummings. And you should be now familiar with the term iceberg. So our first language features and our second language features are so important for the aspect model and the importance of having both L1 and L2 to develop language proficiency. If you're proficient in our L1, you're invariably going to be proficient in your language too. If you're not proficient in L1, it's going to be very little transfer. And you might find that you, if you battle to read L1, you're going to battle to read L2. If you battle to write in L1, you're going to battle to read in L2. Because you've got this common underlying proficiency which operates at the bottom and they both support each other. Once, if one's gone, the other one suffers. So we need both our L1s and L2s. L1 and L2 speakers are more proficient in everything. So the traditional grammar, grammar paced teaching looks at a lot of rules. And this is why I always say isolated grammar rule. And research has shown that these grammar rules are really fragile. And they're soon forgotten. That's my question. Um, they are the tip of the iceberg. And our traditional instruction, which focuses on grammar as an output, only focuses on the tip of the iceberg. Okay. And whatever that tip is, and whatever you think you've managed to construct of that iceberg at the top, it's quickly going to melt away. So if you think your students know rules and they're all, they're all together with it, 
that's going to melt away quickly and it's going to mean nothing. So please don't focus on these isolated grammar rules and understanding that. Um, it should become part of the whole teaching, the text-based teaching experience. So yes, Cummings' is Iceberg model. Um, he speaks about basic language proficiency or BICS, and that is surface learning. That's your grammar, it's your vocab, it's your comprehension. It's your speaking and listening. It's far easier, it's more casual than the writing and the reading. So BICS is the basic interpersonal, interpersonal communication skills. It's the vocab, it's the pronunciation, it's the grammar, it's the comprehension application. Kelp. Cognitive academic language proficiency is not fix. You can speak and listen to a language, but you cannot maybe write it and read it. Does that make sense? So because you've got fix doesn't mean you've got kelp. Okay, and I think you should all realize that by now. So some of the best speakers in your class might be the worst writers and readers because they haven't got the kelp. They don't have cognitive academic language proficiency. And this is when you're able to analyze, synthesize, evaluate things. And this is where we want our learners to get. This is when they go on to the higher cognitive levels in the questions that we set. Okay. This brings us to the language teaching context. It's like a gear machine. The community, the school, parents, peers, and students themselves are the big cog in the middle. Okay. That's where language is situated. On the outside, the small little cogs, the small little gears, that's the teachers, but bigger, and often the students trying to get there. So the language teachers are often the outsiders to this. They've got all the rules and the knowledge, and they've got to try and unlock this knowledge in the learners so they can get the conventions and the knowledge. So we're trying to give it to them. The community, school, family, and peers are the insiders. They've got the information. But the students are also on the outside, the small little baby, little gear that's trying to keep up. And they often have to invent, bluff, and copy to get the language expectations because they don't have it themselves. And I often see this when students are just downloading stuff from the internet because they just don't have the words to put it down in your assignments. Those of you that are downloading and copy-pasting patchwork sections, it means that you are trying to copy the discourse. You haven't got your own words to do it. And you still have to have all that knowledge unlocked and proficiency levels. So if we look at the discourse language theory realities is that academic language is a discourse and it's often a foreign language to many of our students. It's very strict and rule-based content-based of the way of looking at things and discussing things. So it's not just like casual conversation. It's you've got to use language correctly when you're writing and when you're reading. And that's how we look at things using this more formal discourse. It's not the same as I said, it's casual conversation. It's got rules and functions that you have to use. You've got to have concord. You've you can't say I is, you must say I am, and so on. So one student identified that I can't use my style and application from everyday life when I do this. So this is difficult for many of our students. They can't do it. They can't write in a strict rule-based way. Um, so academic language is a different language in many ways, but it is still another language. As I said, it's a foreign language to many of our students. They can't understand it. So what is this reality for us as English teachers? We presume and we assume too much, okay? So this teacher said to me, we still lose a lot of our students, and I think I lose a lot of you as well, because I don't think they've been orientated to think what is expected of them. And I think about my assignment requirements and how often you battle with that and how often I can't understand why. So what is expected of you is often not very clear. So we make assumptions about this. I make assumptions that you should know how to reference, that you should know about in-text citations, that you should know it's not good to copy and paste. Uh, so we make assumptions, for instance, that they know it is right to quote verbatim. So is that an assumption that we know that if it's quotation marks, it must be verbatim? Do we spend enough time orientating the students to what the academic culture is? Do I spend enough time orientating you to how to format an exam paper or paper two or a memorandum? What is the culture of that? How do you use text? How do you put mark allocations in? 
One teacher said, perhaps I know that I do mention it in class and I know I do mention it in my recordings, but maybe it must be emphasized a lot more. So maybe as teachers, as lecturers, we need to emphasize and go over things a lot more. And this is where the practice model comes in. So what do students do to acquire their language skills? What must they do? They must. You must accept that initially academic language is going to be a foreign language for our students. And it's going to be in conflict with their home discourses. It's going to be very different to the language they use at home. So Angela Carter says, to learn the academic language often means the students must be able to try it on. Pretend they put it on that jacket, okay? And this is how they could possibly do it. To learn this new discourse, they need to try it on. And this means they're going to have to often look at the lexis, the wording, the vocab. Also, the structure of the academic essay. What does the introduction look like? What is the conclusion like? What do those phrases mean? What do those sentences mean? So they sometimes take a whole lot of things and shove it together, which becomes a hybridization of language, which means nothing. And I've had some assignments submitted, which I know has gone through a Grammarly's or something, and I can't actually understand what has been said. But some of that within that, this mixture, there might be some new academic discourse coming through. But often this might be resulting in plagiarism as well. So it's a very hard thing to acquire. Okay, there's your plagiarism. So students need to try it on though. So you've got to give them opportunities to try it on. So you've got to give them large collections of models to work from. Someone said to give them lots of friendly letter models so they can actually start to see the structure and what it must be included in it. So they can understand how the texts work what that must be structured, what's the content that goes into a friendly letter, a formal letter, um, a dialogue, whatever it might be, that they know how it works. Get those models so their brains can start understanding what it is. So she says extensive modeling is needed, not just one or two, lots. Give them extracts or examples of good and bad letters so they can see when is the, the structure good, when is the structure bad. And this is what she says you should have. You should have lots of practice in comprehension strategies, how to write comprehensions, how to paraphrase things. Things is very difficult. Summary techniques, how to summarize. What about looking at models all the time and showing students how these can be used? Models of good essays and models of bad essays so they can see what makes a difference. As well as inappropriate referencing strategies, mix up referencing skills and let them actually go and fix it up as well. And finally, they will understand possibly what plagiarism is all about. Okay, so learning strategies to acquire the target language, their first additional language, um, they're learning that. They've often got to perform something, so they're acting it out, it's the work of others, listening to other people, and then rehearsing it. It's like a play. Um, rehearsing that language use and that's how they start to acquire the target language and so we allow them to code switch by, between one l1 and l2 and that's fine because if they see in the language hearing the language and reading the language by code switching those few times into l1 is fine role play that means crossing adopting language styles associated with their with identities in which they have no investment. So they adopt a language speaking style of a shopkeeper or of a person interviewing someone else or someone giving directions. And so they've not invested in that, so it doesn't really affect their identities. Or what Krashen calls code meshing, uh, that's kind of garaja. Um, that's negotiating contact zones and appropriating the boundaries and we do this by writing something in L1 and then translating it into L2. And so we start to see how one knows it's actually how these structures actually work together. And also apprentice them into real life activities. So they pretend to be um, an announcer. Um, they pretend to be giving speeches. They pretend to be um, writing letters, all those things which are real life activities. So you have some theories for copying, modeling, and trying on and practicing language. Um, so we're going to challenge meaningful learning. So the learner engages with academic discourse and language use and literacy practices, which will ultimately lead to self-transformation. So by practicing, they're going to engage with material. If you don't give them time to practice, they can't engage with language use and literacy practices. And that's what we want.
So how do we practice for proficiency? Many students do not read or write in English proficiently. They really don't. Um, even if they are English speaking, they might not read or write well. And so to align that literate habitus with their literacies, their home literacies, okay, results in tensions within them. They don't want to read, they don't want to write because there's a tension between the way they speak and the way they read from their home backgrounds. So what must they do? They must practice, practice, practice. Um, so after teaching internationally for, for five years, I've realized how important modeling and practicing are for, for all my tasks. And over there, I just saw reinforced understanding and application of knowledge and rhetorical stru structures. They could, if they practice an essay, if they practice a paragraph, if they practice an email, they would understand the words as well as their knowledge of those structures. And they became familiar with how questions are asked, how to answer those questions in their task, the tests and exams. So um, we had a lecturer who said in, in the UAE, they must never be surprised about everything because they practice everything, they know exactly how to do. So give them chances to practice and that'll ensure that they're more confident in what they're doing. So here's some guided practice structures. All you need to do is practice. And this comes from the Madeleine Hunter model in the 1980s, goes way back. And she calls it the I do, we do, you do, or gradual release of responsibility. Ferreira also speaks about this model. So learning and cognitive load should be shifted to students over time. You don't just dump it on them the first time. We do them in gradations, in short steps. Um, and we do it through teacher modeling. First of all, the teacher shows them how to do it. Then collaborative practice with the teacher um, and, the, and the peers, and then they do the individual application. So the strategy first is, according to Madeleine Hunter, is the modeling, which is I do, teacher models, gives explicit examples, reinforces the paragraph and language structures. Then the guided practice where we do together, the teacher and the learners, as individual and group practice, which is scaffolded and consolidated their understanding and application. Then collaborative peer practice where you do together group work, interactive collaboration with their peers. And then finally, number four only, they've done it three times already, they do their own independent work. Okay, you do it independently. And they independently apply the rhetorical, the word, the sentence, the grammatical structures in writing to demonstrate their understanding. By that time, they've really got it. So what do students think about um, practicing tasks? This was a little um, research model I did. Um, the lecturer provides a lot of practice, um, doing practice every day because it makes me enjoy and try new things. So they like to do practicing. A lot of practice helps me understand. Um, practice sheets help me to improve my writing skills. So this shows there are lots of positives about practicing and students liked it. Um, what did you enjoy about the class? There were 106 participants and 45 or 42 percent said they liked the teacher way of teaching. Teacher feedback, clear explanations, it was easy to understand and using different methods. They like that. They like group work. Yes, they do. Um, then it went down to they like the class activities, the fun activities, the linking activities, the comparison and contrast activities. They like communicating with the teachers and the students and class discussions. They really like that. Especially if you've got appropriate topics with them, they like learning new things. They like the class atmosphere, which they said was chill and laid back. They said that class was not boring. It was a fun class. They like that. Unexpected and different activities. They like class participation. Communicating in their second language, they even enjoyed, and doing practices every day. So this whole idea of practicing really got to them. Group work, time flies, class participation, practicing tasks, and class atmosphere. The entertaining teacher, interesting course, talking, discussing teacher, all things that students like. My granddaughter loves her, um, her grade, I think it's grade six teacher because he's funny. He's got a good sense of humor. So what are the solutions for language learning? Um, this was, you can't really see what she wrote, but I'm going to take a piece out. This is what somebody wrote in her essay. She said, teachers need to make it easier and more fun for them, the students, to concentrate and manage their time to study. So what do teachers need to do? Make it easy. Scaffold them in these tasks 
and as well as make it enjoyable, fun, so they can manage their time and concentrate. They should be able to say about your class, I never want to miss your class because I feel I've lost something important, okay? They want to be there in your class. So teaching for language proficiency requires that teachers cannot be complacent. You cannot sit back, okay, to the extent to which their teaching and learning practices, what I do in the classroom, constrains, prevents. Does it prevent them learning and becoming proficient or does it enhance them becoming proficient? The learner possibilities to participate and acquire the language discourse. So teachers cannot be complacent. They cannot sit back and neglect it. The extent to which their teaching and learning practices will either enhance their learner possibilities or constrain their learner possibilities to participate and acquire language discourses. So what you do in the classroom is vital. So I'm coming on to my conclusion. So literacies acquisition and discourse development, is it a language problem that they can't get the acquisition or the discourse development? Because research shows that no one actually acquires literacies naturally. It's not going to fall down and develop. You're going to have to do something with it. You're going to do something with your teaching and learning practices. Learning acquisition actually depends on what students acquired in their past, their literacy practices, and maybe they are. They were neglected, maybe there were issues, but it does depend on that, but not only that. It also depends on those that you specifically extend to them now in the prison. So what are you doing in your class now to assist? You're not just whining about the primary school and what they did there, you're doing what you can do to extend and help them to gain this, this, this literacy proficiency by practicing, by modeling, by giving examples, by scaffolding, all the time, not once off, continuously. Okay, that's it. I'm over and out, finished and out. And so there's it, English practice. I'm saying keep calm and go practice. That's so important. Practice makes perfect. Okay. And finally, best practices. Um, best wishes for the next year with your results. With everything that you're doing, I just hope that your teaching experience has been enriched somewhat and that you've learned something um, about um, being an English teacher. And I hope it's always fun, um, text-based, communicative, and that the target language becomes the language that your students proficiently acquire because you are the most incredible teachers. So I'm going to say goodnight now, over and out. Um, I'll see you again on email, but um, this is my last recording for this year. 2022 over and out. Oh, I'm just going to go past that. I didn't want that there. Let me stop my share and say, yes, best wishes, home language. <laughs>